anxietycenter.com. Hey, Jim. How you doing? I'm very well, thanks. How are you? I'm good. Good. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for taking the time to allow me to talk today. Uh, you sure we got time for me? I'm, Absolutely. I oh, yeah. Good make time. You bet. You know, the banners, they t- they say 10 to 12, which is two hours long. And yeah. we're a little bit past that. And That's I'm right. Try- no, let's go. Oh. No, I'm here. Okay. All right. Well, let's see. Um, multiple chemical sensitivity. What I want to talk to you about. Mm-hmm. I think uh, I, I sent you a message on the forum about how I had a run in with, uh, I was at work and the people next door uh, were doing some hardwood flooring work. Yes. Then the vapors were over, not overwhelming but they were certainly there and it was like as soon as you know, like you walked into my office and you could smell the volatile organic compound of the whole situation it's just like whoa i mean what is this a furniture you know manufacturing place mm-hmm. now mm-hmm. ended up breathing that for two days but this is the thing is that i was feeling so well and so stabilized that i really didn't even think anything about it i should have right then and there said man get out of here, you know, because the last three, four, five years, I've kind of trained myself, you know, well, you know, harsh chemicals and stuff, not only are they bad for normal people, healthy people, but they're certainly probably not going to be good for you. Mm. But I wasn't even thinking about it because I was feeling so stable and so well, then I just, you know, stayed here at work and ended up breathing it for two days. Mm. And then just immediately just went on just symptoms like you wouldn't believe body burning agitated nerve pain just out of the blue and this lasted for you know a good two solid months before it started to ebb down and i know that you said that you know the reaction to it um was probably you know um the main culprit more than the reaction to the you know the chemical itself and i you know i believe that but then after like three months, I started feeling better again. And my daughter and me went to, um, we went two places. We went to a indoor swap meet, which had a lot of perfumes, incense, essential oils, a lot of just DOCs and, you know, chemical stuff like that floating in the air. Then we went to a mall, which it smelled like they had, I don't know what it was, but it smelled like French napalm or something was mm. dropped on the floor. <laughs> and it, I mean, I was, and again, I was feeling well enough. I really didn't say, well, let's get the heck out of here. You know, I just kind of stayed there for an hour or two. And the same thing happened again. It was just body burning, agitated nerve pain, completely revved up. And then by this time, I was like, well, I'm going to do what Jim said and just not really freak out about it. And just, you know, and it did seem to like I'm kind of that was only a month ago or at least four weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And I am starting to stabilize quicker this time. But I think what I've done is I've. I've activated this kind of multiple chemical sensitivity level two, you know, underlying factor thing. So now I feel like I'm walking through a minefield, you know, constantly looking over my shoulder. So even if I smell a candle, I feel like, you know, the danger. I mean, I, the, the amygdala is just, it fires yeah. right away. Yeah. So, I mean, that's what I'm struggling with right now. Um, you know, I haven't made any changes in my medication. You know, I'm on that Depakote and I haven't, yeah. I seem to stabilize on that. And then I just get, you know, thrown off by now. I do want to say that, um, it's not just these chemical exposures that I was dealing with. When I start feeling better, I think, um, uh, back in your, previous Skype calls, you had a Skype call way back. This is like, you know, maybe 10 years ago where you were talking to, talking to a a gal named Donna. And, uh, she was complaining that she would, you know, she would spend six weeks or a couple months resting and she would get better. 
And then she would return to work and start catching up on all the things she needed to do only to get just knocked off her feet again with symptoms and things. Yeah. And I think that that is contributing a little bit to my case too, because like when I start to feel better, yes, I start doing all of, I start living life. You know, I don't like, okay, maybe I should, my, my body and my nervous system is just now, you know, starting to stabilize some, maybe I should continue to, you know, uh, rest and continue to, you know, kind of, you know, pamper it, if you will, so it can continue to heal. So I have that going on, um, which I can control. But this multiple chem- chemical sensitivity thing, I just wanted to get your opinion on, I've done some research on it, and it seems like a real animal to where, you know, people, when they even get like the slightest whiff of a, like the laundry detergent aisle at the grocery store or something like that, they get these terrible symptoms. I, I'm not like that, but I do seem to get, you know, pretty bad setbacks when I have prolonged exposures to enriched, you know, levels of these things. But my question to you is, is that kind of going to be a, just a combination of avoid, avoiding those situations, number one, but number two, kind of just training the amygdala when I do like walk past a store and they have like candles going on or essential oils or something like that. And the amygdala freaks out. Is that kind of just telling them, no, 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 you're OK. You don't need to. It's not going to ruin you. You know, or yeah, what would probably be the best, you know, way to handle something like that? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> now, you didn't have this before, right? I had it before when I got off my Lexapro six years now, over six years, six years, six years and three or four months. Mm-hmm. So probably 75 months. Um I had a run in with, I cleaned my bathroom. It was three years out from that. I, I cleaned my bathroom and I used Clorox bleach. And I had akathisia really bad back then. And when I remember when I cleaned that bathroom and I was inhaling that bleach, you know, cleaning the toilet bowl, scrubbing the counters, I was even walking on the mop, newly mopped wet floor in my bare feet, you know, soaking it up through the soles of my feet. Right. And, uh, I would, I got really mad. Yeah. I mean, it, it sent me into a wave, like an unspeakable wave for about three months then too. So the answer to that question is yes, I did have that going on back before, but then after that, I was always kind of avoiding that stuff. Like the plague, I'd always, you know, I never cleaned my bathroom with bleach again. Yeah. You know, it, 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 that's why I kind of say is this is going to be a combination of, I mean, I already, no matter what you say, I think I'm, I'm just going to avoid my hardest, try my hardest to avoid situations like that or get myself into situations like that. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, the short answer is yes, I, I have had these before. Gotcha. Okay. Because uh, as you know, you know, being super sensitive to chemicals um, is a really common symptom of hyperstimulation just because hyperstimulation tunes our senses right up. And some people will respond to the the smells of things more than they normally would. So that is one thing. And if we've had a kind of an anxious reaction to that, uh, then we can establish a fear about them. So then whenever we feel or in, encounter strong aromas or smells, that's going to trigger more of a dramatic response than it normally would. Now, do some people actually have true chemical sensitivities? Yes, they do. Uh, they usually show up uh, outside of anxiety and hyperstimulation. So, but if, if here's the challenge. If you ha- don't know what your degree of hyperstimulation was when it first occurred, you wouldn't have any real clear way of saying whether it's hyperstimulation related or how your body's sort of grown to be more reactive to chemicals. Um, Based on what we've talked about, you know, and the history that I know that you have, I would say that this is more related to the hyperstimulation aspect and your reaction to them than actually the chemicals itself. Now, but I could be wrong. Again, I just don't know uh, if your body is developed a chemical sensitivity, those things, and then it's just automatically reacting. So that's going to be the variable. Right, right. Yeah, see, I did some research on. 
you, you know us you know anxious personalities like to do our research or at least some of us do anyway and um you know i was reading like i, I put two and two together I was like okay well there's people out there on the street who like to breathe paint or glue you know yeah. or solvents and stuff and i'm like okay well let's let's look into that because what i was dealing with was the solvent or in this case something you know toluene that i think was the primary culprit hmm. but um uh it, it i researched and i found from multiple you know sources that Huffing paint or glue or, you know, these kind of cheap ways that people get high actually hit GABA receptors. And it acts a lot like alcohol does to the, the point where once the person stops doing the huffing, then that GABA kind of sh shrinks and then the glutamate shoots up you know like almost like you're going through a withdrawal and i read somewhere that they you know it was like tested on rats you know four hour exposures some stuff like this so it's like okay well that seems to be the case and now i feel like since i've done those things that yeah i mean now it's like i just all i've done is train the amygdala amygdala to you know be on the constant lookout to where even a you know scent of a candle i'm like oh my gosh you know run you know mm -hmm. and um i i was never like that before you know yes i had i had a, a good degree of hyperstimulation you know uh, antidepressant withdrawal akathisia whatever but and i had reactions to the chemicals before but i never you know was like constantly looking over my shoulder like i am today yeah. Now, I, I, I will say that when the symptoms come down, it's not so bad. Like today, you know, I, I'm, it's starting to stabilize, hopefully. I mean, it is, and hopefully it continues. Um, and I'm a lot more relaxed about it. But yeah, I mean, it's, I've definitely triggered an animal to where it's a, it's a learned fear, absolutely. And um, yeah, I agree. You know, I just, I, 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 I want to be able to, you know, I've I've done this the wrong way so many times. I mean, I've even researched multiple chemical sensitivity, and I thought, okay, I'd go, oh, oh, look, here's people that live out in their front, in their backyard, in a tent because they can't be in their own house because of the chemicals in their house. That's great. <laughs> Let's read more on that. You know, so, yeah. I mean, so um, yeah, I'm definitely guilty as charged when it comes to going the wrong way with these things. So yeah. You know, of course, what's not helping is the medication. It's, you know, just because it affects GABA so profoundly, it is really mm -hmm. going to skew how we respond to things. And it's going to keep your body, even though it's a sedative, it's going to keep the body geared up in a different way, which is going to keep our senses geared up. So we are going to be overly reactive to certain sights and smells if that's how the body responds to you know, uh, the uh, hyperstimulation and, you know, GABA influenced by medication right yeah and you know i don't think you're going to get a, a clear view of this until that medication is cleared and your body's had some time to stabilize and your hyperstimulation comes down to the normal range now in the meantime you can yeah. work on the fear of course like you can go after and work on extinguishing the fear using you know all the strategies we talk about and if you have connected with the therapist, again, the therapist can give you other strategies in terms of how to contain and how to work on extinguishing the fear. That'll be helpful, but I don't think you're really going to know for certain until those aspects are done. Your hyperstimulation gone, medication's gone, and your body's stabilized. Yeah, and I agree. It's it, it's kind of a – somebody mentioned the, mentioned the two steps forward, one step back thing, and that's exactly where it is with me. My body will stabilize enough to where I think, okay, I keep going in this direction. And I'll be able to make a cut in the medication because, um, you know, I, I have to work. You know, I, yep. there's no on housebound for me. Yep. Uh, I absolutely have to keep going here. And so I'll, I'll get to a point where I'm, okay, let's stabilize. Okay, I, I can feel myself stabilizing. Let's keep going with this. And then I'll be able to make a cut, small cut, whatever. And uh, and then I get, you know, knocked back over, you know, some exposure. Some It's happened twice. So, I mean, I don't yep. plan on making a cut. In my medication at least till after the holidays jim you know, yeah there's just no no yeah, way i'm gonna do that yeah. you know but. and I, I don't want to discourage you when i say this jeff but my experience with benzo 
uh, or you know GABA affecting medications that I could never get to a place of calm. I'd have moments of it, but it'd be a drug to kind of calm. But the minute you know the the drug would kind of dissipate a little bit, I was always in that same spot of feeling a little bit better and then feeling worse again. Feeling a little bit better, feeling you're stabilized, and then you're worse again. It just I never got to that place of complete peace and subtleness because I there's no way for the body to get there. It just can't get mm-hmm. there. We don't have the resources, the medications interfering with the body's natural ability to stabilize. And, it, you know, I understand the, the need for medications, especially the ones that are sedative-based or sedative-like. It's just that it really, when we take it long-term, it really sabotages our ability to be calm and stay calm and to be more resilient to stresses and to, because here's the other thing, as you know, when you know, our stress is elevated, we have a more difficult time extinguishing fear. Because as you know, I think it was Janine earlier talked about, or, or Janice, I think maybe you talked about it, that, you know, once the brain is going and it's in the fear direction, it's just going to keep hunting for that threat. That's just what it does. Yeah. Uh, and so we we'll always find ourselves caught in that situation. And until we can break free from that, until we have our normal resources, until our GAB is back up to normal and stabilized and, and glutamate suppressed and all that, we just can't get there. So I empathize with you and I understand the up and down. It's just, I don't know that, you know, it's a healthy expectation to feel you are going to be stable and secure and all that until some of the stuff is dealt with. Oh, yeah. And, you know, and I'm, I'm doing a good job with, you know, like like the sexuality thing that made me famous here at the Skype you know, calls. <laughs> oh, my, that, yes. That's, uh, that's um, I mean, that's all gone. I mean, I don't even have anything to comment about it because that's like, just, it's, it's gone. It doesn't, even the pelvis, uh, issues that I had, they're gone. Um, and that was all kind of, I would, I would absolutely, I'd be lying if I didn't say that that was mostly level two work. You know, I just, you know, I was afraid to have any kind of sexual, you know, activity or experience. And I just said, Nope, Nope, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to go ahead and do these things and not worry about it. Yeah. And I don't have these things anymore today. Yeah. But, you know, I wanted to, I mean, good for you for doing that. But I'm not sure if you're aware that uh, what's happened here is that the same fear is there. The fear of what if I do this and I go backwards? You see how that's the oh, same yeah. kind of fear as the chemical thing? Oh, absolutely. So while the trigger has been dealt with, the fear is still there. And because I'm saying that, um, it would be really good to go after the fear or fear of having things send you backwards. Because I think that's probably more predominant here than anything else. Do you know what I'm saying? Okay, so like um, like if I go into a restaurant and I can smell like the cleaner that they use to clean the bathroom or something like that, instead mm-hmm. of freaking out, just kind of work on that fear, like not letting it absolutely you know, ruin the dinner I have with whoever I'm with. Yeah, but even more so than that, I would be going after that threat. The The main threat here behind there is, is what if, uh, let me ask you, is if you were to rate this uh, threat on the scale of 0 to 100%, 100% means maximum, 0 means not at all, how, fear, how fearful are you of not getting better? Well, you know, I'm, I've answered that question a lot, um, but... It seems to change because, like, honestly, I know I can get better. Mm-hmm. So I that fear is really not that. I'd have to say 50-50 this today. Okay. Um, and the only reason why is because my body does stabilize to the point where I can enjoy life. And it's, you know, I, I'm with you. I'm like, as long as I'm taking the Depakote, which is a, you know, GABA drug, yeah. I'm never going to get, you know, um, you know, a hundred percent able to, you know, calm and stabilize, but yeah. my body does get to a point where I can, you know, enjoy life, it, you know, work my job, not be an absolute hell and it, it stabilizes and then it gets thrown off by some reason, but I don't even know, you know, if I, so I know I can get better, but okay. then there's a little side of me that says, well, you know, you know, maybe this whole thing is just kind of a, well, you're going to stabilize and then get rocked off. This is going to be a repeating pattern your whole life. So that, I might, mean, I, that might be the greater fear here. The fear of 
always having to be up and down and not really get to the finish line. So where would you rate yeah. that on a scale of zero to 100%? Okay, well, if, uh, I'd probably rate that at about, you know, a 75 to, uh, yeah, a, a solid 75. Okay. Yeah. Because there's a, there's a threat here that's a theme running through this here. So, and I think that's probably more of the threat. It's not that you can't get better, but that, you know, you're going to be up and down all the time and never really get to that normal life living thing. And mm -hmm. so whatever you perceive as going to sabotage your stabilization, getting better for good is going to become the threat. You see what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and of course, uh, there's also probably in the back of your mind that there might be some physical reason for the chemical thing, which could sabotage recovery. Would that be correct? Yeah, uh, for real. I mean, that's, uh, you know, anytime it's, it's, it's happened twice. Well, it's happened three times. The one of those three times was three years ago, but it's happened twice now to where uh, any prolonged exposure to a very enriched chemical environment. And I mean, like a, a toluene, you know what I mean by toluene, right? Solvent, gasoline, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, paint, that kind of thing. Yeah. Any kind of an enriched toluene atmosphere, prolonged um, exposure. Yeah, it does. It, it, it's happened twice now where it's, it's brought on severe symptoms for yeah. uh, the first time was, you know, two and a half months. This last time it appears that it, it's starting to subside after four weeks. Gotcha. So yeah, sure. that, that I, I do. I mean, that's why I'm constantly looking over my show. I mean, I got, I'll even, you know, be completely honest with you. I have, I bought a little meter that measures those things in the air. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And I, yeah. when at my place of work, I have to test the air to see if there's anything harmful that I can't smell. Yeah. And that, that's where I think this is getting a little bit out of hand because I mean, that's what, that's what makes this thing bad is where you can't even go anywhere without a little freaking meter. You know what I mean? To measure the air quality. Yeah. 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 You know? So how does one address that? I mean, uh, again, the, the fear isn't so much that I'm not getting better. The fear is that there's going to be things throwing roadblocks in your way so you don't get better. Right. So, all right. So, um, and typically when it comes to extinguishing fear, we need evidence to build our confidence to extinguish fear. So one way you can do that is by working on, as you mentioned earlier, working on uh, containing the fear response to the chemical thoughts. And here's why. Because you want to sort out whether this is a uh, physical response or if this is an anxious response. And the way you can do that is by working at containing your behavior to see if it's an anxious response. Just like as you extinguish the other one, you can do it with this one too by, as you mentioned, all right, yeah, the smell is here. I'm not going to react to it. Gear down here, just not going to do that anymore. If I'm contributing to this, I'm going to shut this off right now. And I think if you keep doing that, you'll probably find that you won't be as sensitive to those chemical things as you might fear that you are. Okay. Yeah. Cause I've, I have done that already. I've started practicing that. Like, uh, I went into a gun store the other day and you know, I, you could smell gun oil, gun cleaner, da 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 da. da and yeah. I was like, okay, this is, this, this is it. I was in that store for 40 minutes, you know, 45 minutes. Yeah. Usually these, drastic setbacks from these chemical exposures are delayed like by three or four days. Gotcha. Okay. Well, that's and a tip I, off. That's a tip off right there. I'm sorry. That's a tip right there. Um, okay. Yeah. I think what's going on here, it's more the fear of it. You have established a fear about this and that fear takes a toll on your body and that's where your symptoms pop up. So I would suspect, that if you were to contain your anxiousness, so when you go into those things and say, well, my body responded dramatically, not because of the chemicals, but because of my fear about what that might happen. I need to contain my fear. Well, even though that like the first time that the chemical exposure I got uh, from the polyurethane, like the, the hardwood floor finishing from my work four months ago, I mean, I wasn't really focused on i mean when i breathed that i was like I, I didn't even think nothing of it and then four days yeah. later the the symptoms came out i mean i wasn't afraid of that smell or anything it just hit me and yeah it's and then kind of put, i put two and two together once the symptoms came i'm like huh yeah why am i getting pounded with symptoms right now 
Yeah. And, I, uh, I was just going to say, just sorry to cut you off. I was just going to say that it's unlikely that it's the chemicals doing this. <laughs> they usually pr produce a very, very quick response. Um, and sometimes we can misassociate things to our increase in symptoms. This is why I recommend keeping a stress journal so we can look back to identify what is causing our rebound of symptoms. Because again, anxiety symptoms, symptoms of stress. If we have an increase, we've got to track back to the stress. It could also be you may have been cutting at the same time. We just, you know, don't have all those pieces of information. And we won't know 100% yet until you work at containment and give your body time. But I suggest there's a stronger component of anxiousness about being sent back than it actually is the chemical stuff. Yeah, I mean, I would agree. And, and I have to say that, you know, the first chemical setback with the flooring, um, just that, you know, I was doing a lot of overactivity. I was walking a lot or just a lot of stuff was happening to where, you know, like you had in that previous phone call a decade ago with that lady, Donna, you know, I've listened to that. And when she said, you know, that she spends six weeks, eight weeks resting, and then went back to work for, you know, just normal for a week or two or something. And it was just too much. And she just got all her symptoms came back. You know, I was like, well, there's got to be something like that going on, too. Not just this chemical thing. That yeah. also with the, you know, like you said, the level two stuff, the fear. So it's almost like a triple whammy. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I mean. And then if we're at, if if we have unaddressed underlying factors like. We feel we have to people please and you know be when there when the customer is there or for feeling pressure because we have to get all these things done. All those contribute to the stress that can drive up symptoms. That's why oh, we're yeah. so big on going after underlying factors because uh, again, uh, um, if we're working in the public or working you know in a job that we manage ourselves and we're feeling pressure from X Y Z, well we have to identify what's the threat of the pressure, you know driving yeah. the pressure. Um, if I'm, you know, when a customer comes in, am I tensing up? Or if I'm tensing up, okay, why am I tensing up? Is that a, I want to be liked or do I want to keep the customer? Or what's that all about? So we want to track those down. So when we're in the job, all the behavioral stress is gone. And until we do that, going back to the job can bring that stress on, not because the job is particularly stressful itself. It's because we have underlying factors that haven't been addressed. That's increasing our stress. And it's, 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 see the complex mix of it, right? Oh, oh, absolutely. This complexity of this whole thing, it's, it's almost <laughs> like, you know, you you figure one thing out and you work on it and you get it resolved to a, a point, a certain point anyway, and then just something else comes along. I mean, uh, I got COVID a year ago to like literally a year ago today. And um, the setback that threw me in, I mean, I've, I've got PTSD from that. I mean, just yeah. the way the trees look, the sky looks you know everything from that fall i just even the store that i was at before i went you know to the hospital i mean i can't drive by that place without getting an exact replica of that feeling that i was a year ago yeah you know i got covid a year ago today too that's weird oh it's not a fun thing and no no and i even contracted pneumonia from it i had to stay overnight in an er to get antibiotics and and i'm like you after um, about a month afterwards, it seems like my symptoms got worse and I was because I was so hyped up from the fear. Mm -hmm. um, but what was weird was when I had it, my symptoms were lowered because I was so concentrating on COVID. So my symptoms weren't that bad. But but yeah, it, it, I'm the same way you are with the derealization. Everything got worse, visual and the vestibular stuff. And yeah, yeah it was pretty freaky. Yeah. COVID in hyperstimulation is cruel and unusual punishment. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it sure I is. I had COVID in September. <laughs> it was bad. And my dog died too when I had it. My my oh my my baby died. Yeah, and so I was having to deal with that. And then two weeks after that, my cat died. So oh, November geez. was not a good month for me last year. Oh my! In December, yeah, yeah. And I'm sorry, Janice, because you're not off to a good month this month either. Yeah, <laughs> it's not, it, it, yeah. It's not October, November, not going to be good. They're my favorite times of the year, so I'm going to have to somehow deal with that. And yeah, try to re reframe where you can, right? Yeah, have a different perspective about it. That's what I have to do. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but it kind of freaked me out when you said that because I thought. 
that's when I got COVID too, right November 1st. <laughs> uh, no, it's definitely, I mean, it's, it's part of, I mean, it's definitely in part of my, my yeah. underlying uh-huh. right now. Just, you know, it's like, okay, I don't, it, it's almost like my brain, my amygdala is telling me to prepare for the sequel or a repeat of the mm-hmm. same process. And I'm kind of just doing my best just to ignore it and do the right things. And, but it's uh, trying to protect you. So you wonder why, why is your brain trying to protect you? You know, I, I, I'm thinking, I try to delve down into that. Why are you trying to protect me? What are you telling me? Yeah. Because that's what it is doing. Yeah. The amygdala. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, I've always, I've said this plenty of times too. It's, you know, I have my daughter who's my, just my life. You know, if I didn't have my daughter, which I can't imagine not having my daughter, but let's just say I didn't, I don't think I would be struggling with most of this level two stuff. I mean, I would probably just be an alcoholic or something and, <laughs> <laughs> and you know just drink my Jeff, Jeff I just love you so much <laughs> you make me laugh you make anxiety fun yeah yeah I wanted to say too that you know you know Janice you're so right the brain is trying to protect us but it tries to protect us because we have a bank of core fears that we've established that's why it's so important to go after those core fears because once we empty that bank the brain doesn't feel it has to protect us from anything. So that's, you know, I just wanted to say that that's why the level two stuff, especially going after core fears, really makes a huge difference in long-term success. Yeah, it's true. I, and, you know, I had myself figured out some things too, like, you know, through all this that I never thought about, like, why am I such a control freak? You know, why? Because that has been such a stressful part of me um, with raising kids and, you know, just having to do everything and everything has to be perfect because I didn't have a perfect childhood. So my children have to have perfect. Everything was so stressful. Yeah. And it was like, why is that? Well, maybe it's because growing up, I didn't have parents to do things for me. I had to do things for myself Yeah. from like, you know, nine, 12 years old up. So I have to be in control of things to make me feel safe. Yeah. Yeah. You bet. That's the and safety I figured mechanism. that out, and I never, never ever would have figured that out. Yeah, yeah. And we have reasons for all of our fears. So it's just a matter of understanding where they come from and then replacing those fears with healthy ways of coping with whatever we thought was dangerous. So that's why recovery is, you know, is, is almost guaranteed when a person does that work. It's just that a lot of people don't do that work, and so they continue to struggle. But we go after our core threats. The brain has no reason to trigger uh, stress responses because we've emptied the bank of core fears. Hey Jim, let me ask you real quick. On um, when you said um, when you're on your benzo, now I, I I gotta acknowledge the fact that what I'm on is not a benzo, but it is a GABA drug. So yep. we can basically talk the same talk. I mean, we can we can we can relate. I'd agree. Yeah. Okay. Um, the when you say that you couldn't, you could feel better, but you couldn't completely calm yourself down. And then, was that something that could be? Like you could, uh, you could maintain that level of a somewhat stable, but not quite, or would it kind of just still be erratic? It would, you would only have moments of that it un, 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 yeah. uncontrolled. It would only be moments. And, you know, uh, before I struggle with anxiety disorder, if I wanted to be calm, I'd sit and be calm. I mean, I could sit and be calm as long as I wanted. And my emotions were stable, you know, physical responses were stable. When I got an anxiety disorder and, you know, hyperstimulation went through the roof, it was none of that. It was like my body was just like a, a freak show. <laughs> it was all over the place. Yeah. And then when they put me on the benzo, well, I got some calm in moments, but I could never calm myself to the place that I did before. Like I could feel calmer, but I was never calm. There's always something going on just below the surface. And then there was times when I wanted to be calm and I couldn't. It's just like my body just was not responsive. And that was the way, all the way through my benzo use. Could never get to that place of being totally peace and calm and stable. Just never felt mm-hmm. that way. It was only after I broke free, went through the withdrawal process, stabilized, gave my body time, is when I could say, wow, I can feel calm again. I remember, I remember that vividly because it was such a revelation that, wow, I can feel calm again. Like, this gave me back complete control of my body, whereas I never had it before with the benzo. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So whenever I wanted to be calm with the bench, I had to take another one. That's just how it worked. Okay. 
Yeah, it's um I mean the the medication thing that I'm on, I mean I I truly I mean I I don't know. I I think it works. I mean I I feel that it works, but there's just a lot of tremoring and stuff that that's it uh you know, it comes with it and stuff, but there's days where like I said, I feel you know, it could be a little better, but it's not bad. It's, there's days where it's like, okay, well, if I had to settle for this for the rest of my life, at least I wouldn't be depressed about it, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then, but you know, like I said, you know, um, then I'll get tripped up on something, either a chemical exposure or the fear of a chemical exposure or too much activity or all the above, you know, and then I'm really, you know, not feeling well at all. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess bottom line is I need to, like you said, not so much challenge or maybe it, it is a challenge, but like when I walk into a store that's got, you know, uh, essential oils or a Glade plug-in that's shooting, you know, solvent based, you know, fragrance in the air and stuff like that is probably, you know, just don't do your hardest to not freak out about it would be the best thing. Yep. Yeah. Obviously, I don't want to be in there like, you know, sucking on the thing, but, you know, yeah. I just you don't want to, you know, help it by, you know, fearing it like, oh, my God, run, you know, that yeah. kind of thing. That hey, kind Jeff, of thing. can I ask yeah. you a question? What What are you actually really afraid of with the smell? Are you afraid that it that you're going to die and that maybe I mean, like, what's the real fear there of the smell? What how how is it something that's fearful for you? I, I have something that's called akathisia and it's, it came about when I got off my antidepressant and it, it's not all the time, but it's, it's a feeling of, um, Jim has it on his, on his symptom list, but it's a symptom. It's a feeling of, um, a restlessness and a terror and a fear so pronounced that it literally drives people to do things they don't want them to do. Or they, they shouldn't do is it like the fear of is it the fear of maybe dying from it or or getting real sick and suffering and maybe no one will be able to take care of your daughter i mean like what is like the real all that is a trigger warning i'm just going to say trigger Uh, warning buddy in the future that may be listening you know listening to this you know this is a triggering but um it uh twice now or at least three times now in the last six years that i've had a severe chemical exposure it has made the um, symptoms a suicidal level. Okay. So, yeah, it, just imagine, you know, your symptoms getting to the point where, you know, you see no way out but to uh, end so it that, all. That sounds like like that's the, maybe the core fear of it, you know. Is- oh, that's, well, that, see, nobody wants to be there. So, I mean, yeah, it's like when you have that feeling, then that PTSD, yeah, and then I make that connection. Okay, well, that, you know, that that fluorine, uh, you know, polyurethane is what did that to me. So, guess what? I'm not going to be anywhere near a, <laughs> and yeah. go near that because I don't want to feel that way. You know what I mean? Or, you know, I think the second time it happened, I was in that indoor swap meet for a couple of hours and I was at a mall that just, I mean, it was smelled like a, like a, when I say French napalm, I mean like it was just, it was terrible. It was, or even my child was like, Oh wow, that's strong. And, um, you know, I was breathing that for an hour and you know, that it, that was even worse than, you know, it was almost like I had just rekindled the first setback cause I was just barely crawling out of the first setback and I yeah. felt a little bit better. So I went and did these things. I breathed more chem- chemicals. So it made the first setback. Not only did it kindle it, it made it worse. Yeah. And so that just further, you know. So I, your brain is attached to fear, a fear to. Oh, to yeah. yeah. And, oh, yeah. Now it's. 100%. Which doesn't mean that you can't get out of that. I mean, I, you're doing the right thing, I think, by just exposure, exposing yourself to certain, you know, to. to you know, to the stores or places that have smells and doing what you were said you were doing, like you did at the gun store and stuff. You're right. gonna, yeah, you have to do that. I guess you're going to have to show your brain that it's nothing to be afraid of. It ain't going to happen overnight, but um, right. you're doing the thing. I've done that. I, that's a good point because I never really finished that point. And uh, you know what? I, this is, I'm going on for 40 minutes here. I know that we 
probably going to wrap things up, but you know, I, I, there have been, you know, a lot of occasions in the last, I'd say two weeks where like that gun store, the, you know, the s- smells in the gun store and fragrances at different, you know, uh, like I come in here to my work and people have on strong perfumes and, or the lady that works here with me wants to light a candle. A lot of these things and I've done the level two work and I've just, okay, we'll just calm down. And things really haven't escalated like I thought they would. So that's good. Yeah. I do believe that that's, you know, a major part of it, but I also believe, well, yeah, if you have a toluene enriched in a chemical environment and you go in there and you breathe it for a couple hours, Jeff, then yeah, I expect to feel like crud for the next. That's two, right. You know, so I have to do that kind of a, work too is to avoid those kind of things and i got to stabilize to get off my medication and i got to work on level two and underlying factors and it's just a it's a long laundry list but on a positive note today anyway you know i'm able to go to work i am feeling better that sexual thing that got me famous before that's gone you know there's um there's there's a lot of positive things in my life that are, you know, happening for me, but it's just slow, like like Jim always says, and it's work, like Jim always says. So, Jim, you, I, you know, I thank you so much. And I actually have a friend that lives, uh, doesn't live in Alberta, but she lives in uh, Saskatchewan. Mm. And mm-hmm. uh, I wasn't going to go there anytime soon to visit her. but Not, um, not this time of year. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no doubt. But uh, she was... Talk. I also I follow a guy on YouTube who uh, he like I don't know they he built like this um, little raft or something and he floated down the Saskatchewan River mm. and I thought oh that that'd be fun and just you know a wildlife and stuff there so I kind of wanted to see about taking a trip to Canada but I don't know I was thinking about Banff if anything and I know yeah. that I'm now not the time so. Mm. Yeah, we're just a little ways from Banff. It's one of the prettiest places in Canada, I think. <laughs> That's what I've been told. I, my yeah. my friend who lives in Saskatchewan, she said, well, you know, yeah, you can come by and see me, but if you really want to see Canada, go to Banff. And I was like, oh, okay. So yes. I've been to Vancouver and mm. Niagara Falls. So I don't know if that oh, yeah. counts. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> nice too. You know, bef- before you go, Jeff, you know, as you've been talking here, I think – I'm going to go on a limb here. I'm thinking all of your reactions to these chemicals is anxious-based, anxiety-based. And there's reasons why. Some of the symptoms you talked about aren't classic for chemical sensitivity, uh, whereas they are for hyperstimulation. And just because you're reacting the way you do and the length of time between your reactions show up really speak to anxiety as being the issue and the core fear of having strong symptoms caused by that, not knowing what to do. And you mentioned the fear of, you know, not, thinking that you might not be able to control your reactions as a result, which has established a fear. I think it all comes back to anxiety rather than anything physical, personally. That's what I would suggest. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, that's that's comforting because it does. It, you know, when you I, – I can't lie. I mean, I do. Every day I think of like four or five times. It's like, geez, do I – do I need to be looking over my shoulder every minute of every day? You know, am I yep. walking constantly work, walking through a minefield and I don't have any freaking feet left? You know, I can't yep. step on an land mine because that would be it. You know, and you know, I, those thoughts are nothing but pure anxiety. So. Yeah, I, I would agree. And, you know, obviously the medication is contributing a little bit to it. But I think you can do a lot of this if you treat this like a fear rather than chemical sensitivity. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's the plan. Sounds good. Well, uh, you know, just, well, you know, it's not going to go fast. <laughs> Extinguishing oh. fears is a pain in the butt and it takes time, but you can do that just like you did the other ones. And so you can do it to this one too. So that's, again, I agree so, with you. They work. So Jim, is the extinguishing fears, is it just reframing and then repetition? Is that? It's, yeah, it's dismantling the fear first off, like going after those three factors of fear. You want to find something. With, to, the, with the anxiety or with the containment worksheet? Yep. Yeah, identify the ones you can do. Um, for example, with uh, just using the chemical sensitivity as one, you know, remember the three, the three conditions of fear, something bad is going to happen, it's going to be imminent, and there's nothing I can do about it. So with this one here, there's a lot you can do about it. You can change the anxiety. You can reframe it. And you're, so you want to 
come up with a containment a strategy that can help you minimize the threat. And then when you go into those threatening situations, you want to continue to use those uh, containment statements to keep yourself calm. And as you become more successful, your confidence builds. As your confidence builds, all of a sudden, the next thing you know, the brain's not triggering those stress responses and fear reactions anymore. You know, when, when Jeff well, I know it, it'd probably be hard for you, and, but could you give me an example of, you know, my situation on, on exactly what you just said? I can, but I think your your core the the core fear that's driving all of this is a little deeper. Uh, and because I don't, you know, you and I haven't spent a great deal of time together. I'm not exactly sure what that is, and I don't want to speculate. But I think there's a deeper core fear here that's driving everything, and that's the one I would be identifying, bringing it to your awareness, working containment strategies for it, and then using those containment strategies on some of these trigger fears because this is a trigger fear. If you've read chapter six, I think it's in chapter six. It's been a while since I've been in there, but we talk about trigger fears as opposed to core fears. And I think this is a trigger fear for you that's triggering a core fear. Well, I can tell you right now that this is the trigger fear. And then the core fear would be death and dying or being severely debilitated, you know, unable to function. That's what I thought. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's likely. What I thought. And I think also being out of control and doing something you may not want to do is also mm -hmm. part of that. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah. So those um, are the ones that I'd spend time identifying and, uh, you know, connect with this therapist again to help you develop those containment statements on those core threats. Because when you eliminate the core threat, you eliminate all the trigger fears. And that's, that's the value of going after the core threat, identifying, becoming aware of it, developing containment statements and working to extinguish it because then you just eliminate the whole domino effect. It's all gone. So that's what I'd suggest. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It sounds. Uh, I have um. Uh, Stacy well, parts ways, so I'm, okay. I'm, I'm, I. I don't know. He says I can email him. I kind of thought maybe instead of like, look, Stace, I'm starting to feel a little better. Can we? Can we talk? But uh, yeah. You know, I don't know if he'd want to or not. So we'll just I'll cross that bridge on my own, I guess. Yeah, I, and 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 if you know if that doesn't seem like an open avenue to you, you can always look for a different therapist. Sometimes a different personalities helpful to you know have a different perspective but in the short term one thing you can do in these environments is when you're going in there and you smell and your body's going to react like it you know like, oh danger because it's gonna because you've established that fear just you know what oh, that yeah. means yeah you want to say okay this is anxiety this isn't a chemical thing this is anxiety i need to contain my anxiety I need to contain my behavior here, not react so turn it from what if these chemical things send me backwards they're causing symptoms to the to okay this is anxiety. This is anxiety. Settle myself down here. Because as you do that, you'll probably find that your sensitivities will diminish in terms of the chemical thing. You'll notice them. But as you extinguish that fear, even using that method alone would kind of prove to you that there's a core threat there. Now, the, the risk of that is that you might overcome that and just replace that trigger with another one. That's why it's important to go after the core threat. But this is one way to get through the chemical sensitivity thing. Now, I'm not ever going to suggest that strong chemicals don't bug us and they especially bother us when the body is hyperstimulated and when we don't have that natural ability to shut off and i also which reminded me i don't want to forget this that it was easy for me to feel quote normal when i was on the benzo i didn't have a frame of reference because we only know what we know it was only after i came off the benzo I finally realized wow this is way different so while you might feel things are pretty good and you could live that way for the rest of your life, which you probably could, it's just not the same as being back to normal without that on board. So just keep mm -hmm. that in mind. Yeah. So if, if I were you, go after that core threat for sure. Use the strategy of this is just anxiety. It's not chemical. I've just learned to be afraid of it. I don't have to be afraid of it. In fact, it's my fear that's causing my symptom spikes, not the chemical. So you deal with your anxiousness and contain your anxiousness, which you can. You can get rid of the symptom spikes, but then also, you know, take some time and go after that core threat and work through that so you're not replacing that trigger with another one. Yeah. yeah. All right. Sounds good. Jim, thank you. For, I got to go. So thank you very much. And I'll talk to you on the next one. OK. Oh, you're more than welcome. Yeah, I appreciate uh, keeping in touch and let me know how you go or how you're doing there. OK. And if I, if I don't uh, speak to you. Um, 
before your hip surgery, I'll be thinking about you. Okay, brother? Uh, I certainly appreciate uh, that. You bet. Certainly appreciate right, that. Man. Okay, yeah. you Bye, take Jeffrey. care. And Merry Christmas, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> Bye, gals. Bye-bye.